The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Looking back, many people think of the years of John F. Kennedy's presidency as Camelot, but alongside the joys of having a young, attractive family in the White House, this period was marked by an intense confrontation with the Soviets. Joining us in the second half of a two-part discussion is Ted Sorensen, special counsel and speechwriter for President Kennedy. For over 40 years, he has chronicled our evolving understanding of the Kennedy family, its achievements and its weaknesses. And now, Doug Besheroff. Hi, I'm Doug Besheroff, and welcome to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. We are continuing our discussion with Ted Sorensen uh, and his uh, wonderful new book, uh, Counselor, A Life at the Edge of History. Ted, thank you for being with us again. I'm happy to be with you, Doug. Thank you. Well, I can tell that um, uh, Ted Sorensen's a lawyer because I paraphrased a sentence um, uh, from his book earlier this evening and he corrected me. <laughs> uh, so let me read the sentence as it is written in the book and ask him what he meant by it because it's particularly appropriate um, in our contemporary world. Uh, no office provides meaningful preparation for the unique responsibilities of the presidency. Yes, uh, that is my belief. I'm an amateur student of the presidency, and I was uh, dumbfounded by the debate uh, this year about the fact that uh, someone who had only, it was said, been a senator in one uh, term, uh, thereby did not have uh, preparation for the presidency. John F. Kennedy had only been a senator and before that a member of the House. And I'd be the first to say that it's true, merely c casting uh, votes on roll calls by itself does not prepare one for the presidency. But then it's hard to say, well, what office does? We've had a lot of governors. They have executive experience, but they have no foreign policy experience. And the executive experience of being the governor of a state, particularly a small state or mayor of a small town, certainly doesn't <laughs> prepare one uh, for uh, uh, national office. But then when you go back, James Buchanan and Herbert Hoover were the two best prepared for the presidency in terms of their records. We all know that Hoover sat paralyzed while the country sank into depression, and Buchanan sat paralyzed while the country sank into secession and civil war, even though Buchanan had had several high positions, including Secretary of State. I believe he had been an ambassador. And yet the Senate was debating, as uh, Buchanan's uh, inaction permitted the uh, uh, fires uh, or thunder of war to grow louder, the Senate was debating what would they do if the country split into two, uh, troops seized the Capitol, perhaps the cabinet, uh, perhaps uh, uh, other uh, high officers. And Senator Sherman of Ohio said on the Senate floor, the Constitution already provides for every contingency except a vacancy in the mind of the president. <laughs> I was struck in reviewing the thousand days of the Kennedy administration, how much in the area of foreign policy and foreign crises you had to deal with in three short years. Bay of Pigs, 
Vienna, Berlin Wall, Cuban Missile Crisis, layoffs in Vietnam. It must have felt as if this was just kind of hitting you every day. Were you yes. all thinking this was? Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, of all people, paid a courtesy call upon uh, President Kennedy. MacArthur was not an admirer of his old boss, uh, the previous president, General Eisenhower, and he said to Kennedy, Kennedy told us later, referring to Eisenhower's policy, which didn't accomplish much, the chickens are coming home to roost and you have the misfortune of owning the chicken house. <laughs> So it did seem like a lot of chickens were coming home to roost and that, the, of course, the seeds had been sown for the Bay of Pigs, which a plan that Kennedy inherited, for the uh, crisis in the Congo and in Laos, which were leftovers, and Indochina generally, leftovers from the colonial period, which about which nothing had happened during those previous uh, eight years. So it was one crisis after another. But a few years ago, a British author, whose name escapes me now, wrote a delightful, very seriously historically researched book called Kennedy's Wars. It was intended as an ironic title because his main point was here, John F. Kennedy was a man who had at his disposition, depending on how one interprets the Constitution, the single greatest armed force ever amassed on the face of the earth in terms of power, and yet he invaded no one. He declared war on no one. He, under, he launched no preemptive strikes against anyone. He kept his cool. The country was vigilant. We had a policy of containment and deterrence against the Soviet Union and its allies. But there were no Kennedy Wars. And in my book, uh, I explore that a little further, including what he inherited in terms of Vietnam and what he intended to do about Vietnam before he was killed. But I think you also um, conclude that there was a great deal of learning that took place in the first months of the administration, learning how to interpret what the CIA and others were saying to the president, learning that there had to be other voices in the room. I think he added you uh, and, and Bobby Kennedy to the discussions. So there was a learning process as well. Can you describe that a little yes, bit? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me say that, uh, and thank God we still have the third of the three Kennedy brothers with us as wow. we speak uh, tonight. Uh, all three of uh, the Kennedy brothers, I did not know the oldest brother who was killed in the war, Joe, but all three of the Kennedy brothers uh, had a remarkable quality of growth throughout their public careers. So many people uh, are elected to Washington, think they know it all, they don't need to learn anything more. Not the Kennedys. They all three came to Washington and learned more and more every year. And that was certainly true of John F. Kennedy. He learned from his experiences, he learned from the setbacks, and the Viet and Bay of Pigs was a terrible setback. And I go into some detail there as to the false premises on which it was sold to him. And he changed his procedures, he changed his policies, he changed personnel so that the next time there was a crisis involving Cuba, which was roughly 18 months later, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he had different people in the room, he insisted on knowing what his options were and the pros and cons of each option. He pursued a multilateral policy by bringing in his and consulting and briefing his allies, none of which had happened 
at the Bay of Pigs, and the result was completely different. I want to add something to this from your book, because I think it's also part of the story. Um, these are your words. He changed his attitude, no longer assuming that he had a golden touch that never failed. Yes, that's the danger of new presidents putting too much emphasis on the first hundred days. FDR is responsible for that because he was boasted about what he was going to do in the first hundred days. Uh, Kennedy, in his inaugural address, said all this will not be done in a hundred days. But nevertheless, uh, you do have, when you're sitting in that Oval Office, of course you feel a little bit heady. You've just been elected President of the United States. You think you've got a golden touch. Well, you don't. And Kennedy believed what the generals and admirals and CIA chiefs told him on all this list of false premises on which the Bay of Pigs was launched. And after that, he knew to pay less attention to them and to remember that there is no such thing as a golden touch. Did you pick up a, a difference in his temperament after the Bay of Pigs? Well, as you mentioned, uh, he asked his brother, the Attorney General, and me, who had originally been a domestic policy advisor, to sit in on National Security Council meetings after that, not because either Bobby or I was an expert on foreign policy, but because he knew that we knew how to ask tough questions with the interests of the presidency, that is, the nation, in mind and not just the interests of a particular agency or a department, which was true of the other people around the table. And I might add, when he heard about the Soviet missiles in Cuba, he didn't summon a meeting of the National Security Council. Instead, he summoned those individuals in government whose judgment he most valued and whose recommendations he thought would be the best. He didn't take people who had experience in nuclear confrontations, there had never been a nuclear confrontation. I think many of us at the time didn't realize how close we came. Hmm. We did come close. If uh, Kennedy had accepted the advice of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to launch an attack on a military attack on the Soviet missiles, following it up, as they urged, with an invasion of Cuba, we found out later, we did not know it then, we found out later that the Soviet troops on Cuba had been equipped with tactical nuclear weapons and the authority to use them on their own if there were ever a United States attack. Had they attacked our planes or our, even our troops and ships with tactical nuclear weapons under the so-called rules of engagement, no doubt our military would have responded with at least tactical nuclear weapons. And once you get on that nuclear escalator, you go up and up and then up again and you keep upping the other until both sides are engaged in an exchange of strategic nuclear weapons, totally eradicating the other side, or at least its population and infrastructure. And then, who knows, uh, radi radioactive fallout is carried by wind and water to the far reaches of the Earth. And in time, uh, this planet is nothing but a nuclear desert. So it's because John F. Kennedy resisted in a very dramatic meeting what the Joint Chiefs and, I might add, the Congressional leaders were telling him he had to do, that you and I are here talking today. You mentioned in our last show about how the Kennedys grew. And there's, there's a phrase in your book about that. Uh, you're talking about Teddy, and I'll come back to Teddy in a minute, but you talk about um, a portion of the Kennedy legacy. John Kennedy, in running for office, went through not just 
a long four or five year campaign, but tremendous pain. He still had his back problems. Um, you all were sometimes doing all-nighters. Um, we now know he was suffering from Addison's disease. Um, this could not have been a physically easy thing for him to do. Let me say two or three things. First, uh, when Lyndon Johnson's emissaries began their uh, press conference at the National Convention uh, by uh, saying that uh, Kennedy had Addison's disease and wouldn't last out his first term, we had, nice guy, we had, uh, we had a little meeting with Kennedy's uh, top doctors and from that meeting emerged the conclusion that not only did Kennedy not have the classical signs of Addison's disease as the medical profession, but what he really had was a, a very key part of Addison's disease, which was a, an insufficiency of the adrenal gland for a whole variety of childhood illness reasons, and maybe malaria, who knows. Anyway, uh, it was a decision, did we go out and tell the press Yes, he does have an adrenal insufficiency, or do we go out and tell him, yes, he has Addison's disease? And as I put it, if you were wooing a girl and wooing the American electorate, it has some similarities, would you tell her that you had Addison's disease, which sounds hideous and horrible, or would you say you had an adrenal insufficiency? Everybody agreed, adrenal insufficiency, and that's all we said then. And that's all I'm saying now, despite your attempt to, attempt to say he had Addison. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. So, no, uh, my, attempt... my other big point is... But yes. wait a minute. No, no. My turn. Oh, well, wait, wait a minute. Um, Don't I? My I point I was, was here to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get your... <laughs> but I don't want to be misunderstood. My point was he demonstrated a tremendous amount of physical courage. That's what I'm coming to. All right. There you are. <laughs> That's what I'm coming to. John F. Kennedy was a millionaire's son. He loved the beach. He loved parties. He could have, as a handsome young man, taken his ease in one form or another and enjoyed a rather easy life. And yet there he was all those years getting on and off those planes, standing up on those trucks and trains, making one speech after another, and after he was president, putting in long hours with each of those emergencies that you mentioned. Why? Because he loved this country, and because he was dedicated to public service, and he thought public service was the highest calling that anyone could have, and the presidency happened to be the best and the highest of that calling. And then there was Bobby Kennedy, who you didn't particularly like at first. At first, uh, it's true, uh, he was working for Joe McCarthy, uh, who was a, a scourge on the country. And he was very much closer to his father's very conservative philosophy than Jack was. And a tough touch football player. <laughs> You're talking about the time that the Saturday Evening Post, some of you remember that magazine, Saturday Evening Post wanted to have, an, they were going to have an article about JFK, and they wanted to have a picture of a simulated touch football game, and so Jack, Bobby, and I took a football and went out to the lawn of the Capitol right across from Jack's office in the Senate office building. And so we said, okay, Jack and I would have a, he would send me out for a pass. Bobby would be the defender. I go out, I go up for the pass, and just as my hand closed around the ball, I feel someone else's hands and arms closing around my legs, <laughs> illegal, and down I go onto the Capitol lawn in my one and only best Senate suit. <laughs> so I had a feeling that's the way he felt about me, and it was mutual. And there was, 
But and over time, time passed. Time passed. You grew to respect each other. Very much so. So much so that after Jack's death, uh, each of us realized that the other had suffered a devastating blow. And we became friends and buddies. He became my client at one point after I left the White House uh, after uh, Johnson's, during Johnson's presidency. And, uh, I gave, and then when he started being mentioned for the presidency, I said to an interviewer, well, when I first met Bobby Kennedy, I wouldn't have voted for him for a dog catcher. He was rough, he was tough, he was arbitrary, he was ruthless, but now it's all changed. I was trying to make the same point about how he had grown. But almost immediately, I get a handwritten note in the mail. Teddy, old boy, go easy on those early adjectives. <laughs> um, and then he was gone. And then he was gone, sad to say. This must have been devastating to all the people around the Kennedys. It was to me. Of course, uh, Jack's death was even worse because he and I had been together 11 years and I always thought there would be a lot of time that we would work together for another term, maybe even after a second term. I certainly thought there'd be time for him to sign a picture for me, but we never got around to it. Is that right? And uh, I was in Los Angeles at the time of Bobby's death and I couldn't, uh, couldn't believe the same thing was happening again. But that brings us to Brother Ted, who, when I first met him in 1953, was not much more than the kid brother. Fun, funny, but it was, he then began the same period of uh, growth, graduated from law school, worked for the Suffolk County district attorney's office, decided to run for Jack's seat uh, after Jack moved from the Senate to uh, uh, the White House, uh, faced a uh, difficult debate there on which I was secretly sent up to Hyannisport to brief him, and then grew into a better United States senator than either of his older brothers had been. He was better at the legislative process. He became an extremely successful speaker, a candidate, politician in Massachusetts, and then increasingly was out on the cutting edge of all the progressive issues, especially health care, immigration, civil rights, all controversial, but he's become the lion of the Senate. The Republicans who used to use him, that is his name, as a threat by which they could raise money, uh, uh, now respect him. They pay attention when he gets up to speak. He has been a mentor to all kinds of younger Democrats in the Senate. He has formed bipartisan alliances on one major issue after another. I've been asked to write an article uh, in advance uh, on this subject for him. I hope you're taking notes so I can use all this. <laughs> but I know that there is an audience here that has questions, so why don't we turn to the audience for questions? Good idea. Um, you alluded to the fact that um, the Kennedy-Nixon debates were a lot more substantive than what we've come to expect nowadays. Is there any way to, um, in your opinion, uh, work on fixing a broken public discourse where perhaps one party has cynically uh, taken advantage of um, the lack of substance while the other party is still trying to argue the merits? We are at a, what I hope is a turning point in our history. We must improve the quality of public discourse, because that's what the next president is going to need to win 
not only the American people, but the rest of the world, which now thinks much less of us than it did eight years ago. He's going to need impressive oratorical skills to galvanize the Congress behind him, to convince his own bureaucracy to line up, which is one of the uses Kennedy made of his press conference. That next president is going to need what some people dismiss as just words when he convinces the United Nations that we're turning a new chapter uh, in American history. Well, once again, let me thank our guest for a wonderful discussion. We have a little tradition here. It's almost like the National Press Club. We have a mug. It says Brody Forum. Um, it's got some water in it now, but I'm delighted to pass this to our guest. Kevin, thank you. I'm going to drink the water. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.